Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillah Wassalatu wassalam ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa mursaleen Nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Allahumma anfa'na bima'alamtana wa alimna ma yanfa'una Allahumma zidna ilman innaka anta alimun hakim Allahumma ijal hadihi al-muhadara hujjatan lana la hujjatan alayna ya rabbil alameen Amma ba'ad This evening inshallah ta'ala We will uh, be continuing our class In Zad al uh, We made it to the book Kitab uh, Or Bab al-Jumu'ah Bab al-Jumu'ah As it relates to Bab al-Jumu'ah the section of Jum'ah We did one part in this Inshallah Ta'ala is the Is the last part of it Inshallah Any questions? Any questions about Zad and Mustafa? Huh? Fight. So we made it to Al Fasl fi Makan al Jumu'ah wa Kayfiyatiha. Where are we supposed to pray Salatul Jumu'ah and how are we supposed to uh, pray Salatul Jumu'ah? Qala Musannaf rahimahullah ta'ala wa al Jumu'atu raka'ata. So in order for us <coughs> to establish Salatul Jumu'ah, we must make how many rak'at? Rak'atan, two rak'at, something that is simple. Wa yusannu an yaqra'a jahran fil ula bil jumu'ati wa fil thaniya al munafiqeen. That in these two rak'at, the first rak'at, it is sunnah for us to recite on Yom al Jum'ah, in the first rak'ah, Surah al Jumu'ah. Surah al Jumu'ah. And then for the second rak'ah, it is Sunnah to recite Surah al Munafiqeen. Surah al Munafiqeen. Uh, these are the two suwar, Surah Tan, that, uh, that they mention in Zad al Mustaqni' for reciting on Yom al Jumu'ah. وَتَحْرُمُ وَتَحْرُمُ إِقَامَتُهُمَا فِي أَكْثَرِ أَوْ فِي أَكْثَرِ مِنْ مِنْ مَوْضِعٍ مِنَ الْبَلَدِ إِلَّا لِحَاجَةٍ. Now here we're going to discuss an issue, and this issue is the impermissibility in general. This is in general for establishing Jumu'ah in more than one place in a particular town. So according to the school of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, it is not permissible to establish Jumu'ah in more than one place in a city unless it's due to necessity. Unless it's out of haja, yani that there's a need in doing so. Now, the rest of the, the issues that pertain to this is not really applicable in our, in our country, so we're not going to address them. Uh, however, in general, in general, I remember when we actually studied this with uh, some of the ulama, the issue of establishing Jumu'ah in more than one place was something that was considered impermissible. However, when you look around, there were masajid everywhere. 
So this is due to Hajj or necessity that Jumu'ah were it was established in more than one place in more than one place. طيب. وأقل سنة بعد الجمعة ركعتان. So a person perhaps they would like to pray some sunnah prayer after Salatul Jumu'ah after Salatul Jumu'ah. And so they say aqallu sunnati the least amount of sunnah and prayer a person can pray after salatul jumu'ah is two rak'at yani rak'atan two wa aktharuha sittun and the most a person can pray is six and when they say aqallu sunnah meaning the least from the sunnah here they're talking about ar-ratiba بعض الجمعة says لإنه صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يصلي بعض الجمعة ركعتين that the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام after صلاة الجمعة he will pray two ركعات and this hadith has been متفق عليه from صحيح البخاري and صحيح مسلم طيب وأكثرها ستة and the most that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or the most that a person can pray is six six sunan prayers after salatul jumu'ah and why this is due to the qawl ibn umar it's a position of ibn umar that he said can a nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaf'aluhu he said the prophet alayhi salatu salam used to do this the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do this and this hadith was reported in uh, Abi Dawood. وَيُسَلِّيهَا مَكَانَهُ بِخِلَافِ سَائِرُ sunan, And you pray it in, in, in the same place. And you pray it in the same place. Meaning, uh, those sunan, you pray them in the same place. All six of them. In this case. وَيُسَلِّيهَا it is also sunnah al-fasl bayna fardi wa sunnatihi bi kalam. So let's say, for example, it's time for salat al dhuhr Mathalan, for example, you begin to pray the sunnah before dhuhr. You're by yourself, so there's no one to pray jama'ah with, for example, or maybe there's one person. So you're starting your sunnah prayers. You're, maybe you're praying four rakaat before salat al dhuhr and then you're going to pray salat al dhuhr so they say that it is sunnah uh, to distinguish between the sunnah prayers and the farud, the obligatory prayers, be kalam, with some type of speech. What does that look like? Let's say, for example, we're praying four rakat. We pray four rakat, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. And you stood up, and now you're praying salat al dhuhr. they say saying, la al fasl, to distinguish between dhuhr and the sunnah prayer here. One should talk to someone, move to a different location, etc., etc. It says, "Oh, intiqah min maudurihi," or switch to a different location. Switch to a different location. As for Salatul Jumu'ah, la sunnat Allah qabla al a al ratiba. There's no ratiba before Salatul Jumu'ah. Meaning, consider from the sunnah to rawatib. There's no uh, prayer that necessarily goes before Jum'ah unless a person is coming in and they're praying Tahiyyat to the Masjid greeting for the Masjid Abdullah Abdullah is the son of Imam Ahmed he said Ra'aytu Abi he said I saw my father Yusalli fil Masjid Ida adhana mu'adhan raka'at he said I saw my father praying in the Masjid when the mu'adhan was called the Adhan and he was praying raka'at he was praying uh, Raka'at. Tayyip. Now they're going to talk about some of the sunan, some of the things that we can do that are sunnah on Yomu Jum'ah. So the first thing that is mentioned, wa yusannu an yakhtasila wa taqaddam wa yatanaddaf wa yatatayyib wa yalbas ahsana thiyabihi. Tayyip. So here they mention that it is from the sunnah to make a ghusl on yawmul jumu'ah it's from the sunnah to make a ghusl on yawmul jumu'ah 
It's due to the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa That it is preferable for you or if you were to make a ghusl on this day, it would be better for you. So someone may say, wait a minute. I read a hadith. How many people are familiar with the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he said ghusl yawm al wajib. There's a hadith that say that it is obligatory to pray to make a ghusl on Yom al-Jum'ah. Is anyone familiar with this hadith? You're not familiar with this hadith. You familiar with this hadith, Shaykh? Tayyip. You familiar with this hadith? Tayyip. When you heard this hadith and then you hear them here saying it's a sunnah, what comes to mind? The hadith clearly says the word wajib. Even the Arabic says wajib. What comes to mind? Huh? Is there some contradiction? Huh? Difference of opinion? Maybe. But why is it, why should there be a difference of opinion? The hadith is clear. It says wajib. Wajib? What does wajib mean? Huh? Does anyone know? What, what does wajib mean? You have to do it. If you don't do it, you're sinful. Yeah, I need a little more than that. If you don't do something that's wajib, what did you do? You disobey, what does that mean? What does that mean? You could just disobey Allah and His Messenger and that's that? Huh? Anyone else? Say again? You're deserving of Allah's punishment. So when something is wajib and we leave it off, then we have made it halal for ourselves for Allah to punish us. So, building on top of that statement, there's a hadith that says that ghusl yawm al jumuah wajib, that making a ghusl on yawm al jumuah is wajib. Yet we find here, some of the, the ulama here, they say whether a ghusl, making ghusl, meaning purification, the shower with the, uh, the sunan attached with it, the things that you must do during the ghusl. Uh, if anyone wants, uh, is not familiar with a proper ghusl, we actually did a whole chapter on this uh, when we first started this book. Perhaps you can go back and, and listen to that. Uh, but a ghusl, a ghusl in Yom al-Jum'ah, they say that it is wajib. Like, however, in this book, uh, the scholars, they say that it is sunnah. Why? Why is that? Does anyone know? Huh? No idea. One, one hadith is stronger than another thing. So, in this particular issue, and it's very important, and this is why it's important to always take your understanding from the Sahaba. Who has more knowledge of hadith? You, me, or the companions? The companions. Why, why would they have more knowledge of the hadith than us? Because they were there. They lived with the Prophet ﷺ, and they understood his statements better than anyone else. In this particular hadith, when they use the term wajib, they say this here, wajib here doesn't mean obligatory the way that we understand it. Rather, wajib in that hadith means that it was something that he didn't leave off. Meaning it was a sunnah that was never left off. Tayyip, how do you know that? Because this was the position of the Sahaba as it relates to this hadith in this position on Yom al -Jum'ah, making a ghusl on Yom al -Jum'ah. Many of the scholars of the past hold this position that a ghusl on Yom al -Jum'ah is a sunnah. That making ghusl on Yom al -Jum'ah is a sunnah. So from the sunnah on Yom al-Jum'ah is to make a ghusl, to clean oneself, put on fragrances for the men, and put on a nice garment, and that that person, they go to Jumu'ah, mashian, walking, walking to the masjid. وَيَدْنُوا مِنَ الْإِمَامِ And get as close as possible to the Imam. And in addition to this, some other benefits is that they will read Surah Al-Kahf in that day. 
wa yukthiru dua and make an abundance of dua will be accepted is that clear is that clear طيب. so then when a person increases in dua making dua on yawm al-jum'ah they are making dua hopefully they are making dua that they can catch that that time during yawm al-jum'ah after after salat al-jum'ah there's a time that some of the ulama say is after asr or right before maghrib or now, I mean, there's a lot of statements with regards to the proper time but there's one time one hour during that day that if you make dua in that hour allah will answer your dua and then it says, "Wa yukthiru salata ala Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam," and they also they will increase the sinyan salutations upon the Prophet alaihi salatu salam. And they say, "Wa la yatakhta riqab al nas illa an yakuna imaman aw ila furjatan." That if you come to Jumu'ah, you're not going to when people are sitting there, you're not going to split the people and try to slide in between them. On Yom Jum'ah, unless you find an empty space, unless you find an empty space, wa harma an yuqima ghayrahu fa yajlisa makana illa amma qaddama sahiban lahu fa jalasa fi mawdihi yahfadhu lah. That it is impermissible for a person. There's impermissible for a person to what? To remove a person from his seat in Yom Jumu'ah and you sit in his place. It is impermissible to remove a person from, for example, a brother comes and says, look brother, I'm older than you, let me sit here. You sit in the back. It is impermissible to remove someone from their seat in Yom Jumu'ah. The only time it becomes permissible to do that as if, if that person is sitting there is holding that seat for that person intentionally. Does that make sense? طيب. Another one, it is also impermissible. Let's say for example, a person puts something there to hold their spot and you come and you just remove their thing so you can take their position or their place. This is also not permissible. وَمَنْ قَامَ مِنْ مَوْدِعِهِ مِنْ مَوْدِعِهِ لِعَارَدًا لَحِقَهُ ثُمَ عَادَ إِلَيْهِ قَرِيبًا فَهُوَ أَحَقُّ بِهِ Let's say for example, a brother is sitting here waiting for the salah. He's early, he's waiting for the salah. And he stands up and says, you know what? I gotta go make wudu real quick. So he runs to make wudu and come back and you take his place. This is impermissible. Rather that brother that just left and came right back he is more deserving of that place than you are. Is that clear? Tayyip. وَمَنْ دَخَلَ وَإِمَامْ يَخْتُبُ وَلَمْ يَجْلِسْ حَتَّى يُسَلِّ رَقَتَيْنِ يُجِزَ فِيهِمَا If the Imam is giving the khutbah and you happen to walk into the masjid or to the musalla, then you should pray rak'atain, you should pray two rak'ahs before you sit down. As was reported in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And likewise, wa la yajuzu al-kalam. It is not permissible to speak wal imam yaktu. How many times people give the khutbah, you look down and you see brothers talking and tapping each other. Having little conversation sidebars during the khutbah. This is impermissible. This is impermissible. As uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَإِذَا قُرِيَ الْقُرْآنِ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنصِتُوا That when you are listening to the speech of Allah, uh, you are to be quiet and silent. وَقَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ مَنْ صَحْ فَقَدْ لَغَى وَمَنْ لَغَى فَلَا جُمُعَةَ لَهُ رَوَاهُ أَحْمَدْ The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, where is صَحْ like, you know, tell someone to be quiet because laga, that you have made noise and disrupted. And whoever does this, uh, then there's no jumu'ah for that person. There's no jumu'ah. Now, yes. Say again. Oh, say anything to him. 
Yeah, exactly. you, know, you can hold them and all that, but don't be talking about speaking. You probably, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say you can't tap, but I'm saying you can't talk. The, the text here says you cannot talk. ولا يجوز الكلام والإمام يخطو إلا له أو لمن يكلمه. So when is it permissible to speak when the Imam is giving the khutbah? Is it ever permissible? In the du'a, like, is it permissible for you to talk during Juma when the Imam is giving the khutbah? No. You say no. Huh? No, it's not. Are there instances when it is permissible to talk when the Imam is giving the khutbah? Huh? When the Prophet's name is mentioned. Okay, so he's making dua. We're talking about talking. No. So there are actually two cases. Number one, illa lahu. If a person walks into the masjid and they tell the Imam, speak up, we can't hear you back here. This is permissible as long as he is speaking to who? To the Imam. And likewise, it is permissible for the Imam to address who? The one that is talking to him or anyone. Okay? It says, وَإِلَّا لَهُ أَوْ لِمَنْ يُكَلِّمُهُ وَيَجُوزُ قَبْلَ الْخُطْبَةِ وَبَعْدَهَا And it is permissible for the person to speak before the khutbah and after the khutbah. And some say even between khutbatain. Between the two khutbatain. Uh, that is permissible and there's a lot more detail to it but we're not going to get into the detail with that and with that that marks the end of Bab al Jumu'ah end of the chapter of Jumu'ah now after this chapter there's a couple other chapters uh, we have something called the chapter of Salatul Eid how to pray the two Salatul Eids however we covered that uh, during Ramadan and inshallah before uh, Hajj uh, the Eid comes around again, we'll inshallah cover that again. Uh, the next part here in this book, uh, we have a Bab Salatul Khusuf or Salatul Khusuf. Uh, we can actually go over it, uh, but I chose not to now because it's so rare that a person will seldom have the opportunity to practice it. And if it were to come around again and we knew that Salatul Khusuf were coming, then perhaps we could go over it then at that time, it would be more relevant. As of right now, we can take this information and you may not hold on to it. And so, and likewise with Salat al the Salat when it comes to making dua for the rain. So, the next chapter, or the next book that we're going to be covering is a very important book that it affects everyone. And this is called the Chapters of Funerals and Processions in Islam. And in this chapter, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to start that inshallah next week. However, in this book, uh, it talks about visiting the sick, how to prepare the deceased, what do you do with the bodies, etc., etc. Uh, Abu Sajid and I, we actually thought about actually doing a video with this, like actually going to a location, filming it, and showing how it is supposed to be done. Um, and Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam, he told, he mentioned in the hadith, dhikr hadam al O Ekthim, O Kemakah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, increase in your remembrance of death. And so one of the benefits of, of studying this chapter, the funeral processions in Islam, is that it is a reminder to every last one of us that this will be us one day. And so inshallah ta'ala, we will be covering that. Uh, I don't know how to want to... will probably be in that book for quite some time, uh, but it's extremely beneficial. It even talks about visiting the graves, so who can and who can. It's a lot of ahkam, there's a lot of rulings in Islam in that particular chapter. Uh, so inshallah ta'ala, we'll be starting that next week, inshallah. Any questions? Now. A car, a car, oh, say that again. Regards to establishing what? Jumu'ah. Jumu'ah. Thank you. Uh-huh.
Sure. So the issue is there should not be more than one Jumu'ah in a city unless there is a necessary or unless it is necessary to have that. Uh, when I lived in Mecca, uh, I could walk out of my house and I could walk to the right, they will be praying Salatul Jumu'ah, or I could walk to my left and they'll be praying Salatul Jumu'ah. And they are no more than five minutes apart with a walk. But due to the amount of people, it was necessary. Huh? You imagine a place where a hundred percent Muslim, huh? Then there has to be tons of places for people to be able to establish Salatul Jumu'ah. Now, Yes. They, they, so, uh, in the past, they would have different musallas. They would have different places to pray, but they would pray Salatul Jumu'ah. They have actually they have masajid in the Muslim countries called Masjid al Jamia. Masjid al Jamia. These masajid are the ones where everybody comes to to pray Jumu'ah at. Uh, however, the, the, they say that this should not be done in general. It should not be done. You should not have multiple places to pray Jumu'ah. It should only be in one place. However, if there is a necessity or a need, then you can establish it in different locations. Now, any other questions? No, I can't hear you, Shay. What was the book that you said? It's called Kitab al Janah, is the book of funerals and burials, and visiting the sick, and how to prepare the deceased. Uh, this is a very serious, uh, serious chapter. It's one that no Muslim can escape. There's no escape. You may escape paying salat uh, zakat. You may not do business. You may not get married. You may not get divorced. You may not, you know, there's a lot of things that may not apply to you. But this here, Inshallah Ta'ala, it will apply to every single Muslim. There's no escaping. There's no escape. So it's important to have some khalfiya, some information about it. Uh, just so you for yourself. Uh, and also, like I said, Nabi alayhi salatu salam, he said, always remember death. Uh, this is something that there is no escape. No Muslim will escape death. No human being will escape death. And so you will learn, inshallah ta'ala, uh, in Islam, how these things, how you're supposed to visit the sick, what are you supposed to say, how to prepare the deceased, etc. Now, any other questions? Right, we're going to start with that, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu